What's up, my podcast listeners? This is your host, Rafael Matuszewski. And today's compilation styled episode is all about assessments. Um, if you've been following my work for a while, you probably remember and understand the importance of getting a good, thorough assessment done because then that tells you what you need to work on when it comes to training. And this is probably the biggest thing that I see a lot, especially right now with the new people coming to me to work with uh, in person, is majority of them never had a thorough assessment and or they've had one, but the trainer or practitioner never really gave them some actionable tools, ideas, exercises to do to improve on the things that showed up in the assessment. And in this compilation episode in particular, we go over the functional movement screen. Now, these two episodes were recorded probably three years ago, maybe even four, but at that time I was running a pretty large mentorship of um, new trainers going into the industry and the functional movement screen is a great place to start your kind of journey and at least gives you a baseline of what to know, what to look out for and what not to do and what to do in training. Uh, now I do something called the functional range assessment, um, which is a little bit more thorough that looks at the capacity of each joint. Now is one better than the other? Um, I'm not here to say either, but the important thing is getting an assessment done. And it's funny, at least a couple times that I said this on my podcast, I've had people reach out to me looking for training um, because they're kind of um, frustrated and hit a plateau. And the biggest thing that I'm seeing right now is people coming to me and they're you know, somewhat consistent in the gym and they get to a point where something starts flaring up, something starts hurting and they can't figure out why. And they come to me explaining this to me and when we go through an assessment, I can literally pick out like, okay, this is why this is happening. This is why this is happening. And what we should be doing in your training is this. So then this and this can clear up. And then they're like, holy shit, like I never even thought about it that way. Um, when you train without an assessment and you kind of just do what your friend's doing in the gym or, um, you know, you find a program online or you cherry pick some exercises you saw on Instagram, you know, it can only get you so far before you hit a plateau, injury, flare up, whatever. And it's not until you do a thorough assessment to figure out what the hell is going on and then where to go from there. So in these two very detailed uh, episodes, uh, which I highly recommend you watch because the first part is a presentation styled thing where I have a full on slot, like slides and everything. And the second part is me speaking to the coaches in my mentorship with some slide presentations in the background and also me demoing things. So I would highly recommend you watch this and highly recommend you subscribe to my YouTube channel because we're growing and you know, we surpassed 500 subscribers. So thank you for everyone who's been subscribing to my channel. And for those who've been supporting me since day one, thank you so much. So hit that subscribe button, share this podcast with your friends and family, and let's get into Functional the show. movement screen, how I use it and get to a point where, um, We'll look at the overhead squat, and that's where I'll stop, maybe, or go a little bit further. We'll see how we do on time, and if anyone wants to learn more specifically of each movement, um, I can send them a link to the actual presentation I gave in person. So for those listening, I am going off slides, but I'm going to try to depict a beautiful picture for you listeners and those who are watching over YouTube, enjoy the show. So, functional movement screen, here we go. We're gonna go over the history of the FMS and it all starts with this guy, Gray Cook, and not this guy, Grizzly Adams. So if you're listening, I have a GIF image of 
Grizzly Adams close up where he looks exactly like Ray Cook and he's just not in a way. Um, that's another thing to realize is the way I present. I put in a lot of funny gifs and memes and things like that and that's how I create presentations. I start off with funny memes and gifs and then work the information around those things. But in this one, I don't put a lot because heavy on information. So who is um, Gray Cook? Well, easy enough. He's a physical therapist. He's an author, speaker, strength coach, and the creator of the functional movement screen, which we are going to go over today. And he started the foundation and process of creating the FMS back in 1998 and the premise was to place a standard on movement so he was kind of frustrated in physical therapy school where there's all these different orthopedic tests and a lot of them will you know test internal rotation of this joint external rotation of this joint and blah 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 blah. but it never translated to human movement and how the body worked when you placed exercise upon it so a good example is if someone doesn't have enough internal and external rotation of their hips, their back squat is going to be kind of all over the place. But maybe that same individual, when you place them under a barbell and you know they have terrible internal rotation of their hip, but for some reason, their squat looks good. Why? Right? So this is the struggle that he had. And quite beautifully, he created the screen that would translate directly to what you did on the gym. Then he wrote a book about it called Athletic Body and Balance, I think in 98, 99. And this was kind of the first adaptation of um, the FMS. And then he also wrote a very thorough book called Movement, where he goes and um, goes in great detail of what the functional movement screen is and the SFMA, which is the practitioner version of the FMS, which we'll get into. But essentially, um, if you want to know the ins and outs of the functional movement screen, the book Movement is highly recommended. Um, it's a little bit more on the science side, but I've actually had a handful of clients that are interested in training that went down the route of buying the book and we're kind of floored with like holy crap like this all makes sense um some other good resources um gray's done a lot of dvd um presentations and collaborations and he's done one with greg rose who's a chiropractor and he's the co-founder of um TPI, which is an abbreviation for the Titleist Performance Institute. So the TPI actually has their own assessment that Gray and Greg Rose uh, came together with, along with other fitness professionals and therapists out there in the industry to create a specific assessment for golfers. And that assessment al alone is freaking amazing. So the cool thing about that, it's a pass or fail for each movement and each movement depending on what you've um, failed, will have a correlating swing fault. So even before I see a golfer swing, I already know what they're doing. And I always give this example where when I try to explain what it is, so say they failed four things out of the assessment, and then I go, hey, you know, based on your assessment, you early extend and sway to the right, and your ball slices to the left every time you swing. And they're like, oh my God, how, how did you know? It's just... The freaking assessment. This is where I think a lot of coaches miss out. Like this is where I don't understand why so many coaches train clients without doing a thorough assessment. It's like how do you know what to do with the individual? Like it almost makes you more of a professional being prepared going into the session if you know X, Y, and Z about your client and what exercises are going to help promote better movement patterns and getting people out of pain, right? Like this is probably one of my biggest pet peeves in the industries when I hear coaches that don't have an assessment form. And again, I don't care if it's the functional movement screen or something you made up or something you stole from somebody else, at least have something to figure out what direction you're going to go in when you're training clients. Bam, rant over. So 
another couple people that he's collaborated with Dan John Lee Burns of so Dan John if you don't know who he is I've had him on my show early early on um, he's been a strength coach for 30 40 years and he's adapted a lot of the teachings of great cook how to assess athletes how to make them stronger faster and without fucking up their joints uh, Lee Burn is the co-founder of the functional movement uh, company and it's also another physical therapist really really smart guy another person you should definitely follow um, and then another person that he's collaborated with Alan Cosgrove so if you don't know who the Cosgroves are Alan and Rachel um, are a couple out in California that has a gym that is called Results Fitness one of the best gyms in America when it comes to clients results and running a successful business so anyone listening that is a coach that wants to learn about business and how to run a gym effectively listen up to the Cosgroves I've had Alan on my show before so definitely check out that episode and two other smart really 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 smart people that Gray has collaborated with and they are Dr. Stuart McGill which I've had on my show I was floored with the information that he was giving me and to you guys um, highly recommend that you check him out top researcher when it comes to spine mechanics and what happens to the spine during exercise and movement and then another uh, therapist Greg Levinson another really really smart guy when it comes to human movement movement assessing movement everything so Greg Cook, Stuart McGill and Greg Levinson, Greg Rose those guys follow everything they do because they are going to fast track your career and if you are just a regular Joe they are going to save you a lot of trips to physical therapists if you are training into the gym man that was a lot so going back to the history of the FMS I always start with this quote motion is life I really really love this saying because it makes a lot of sense like our bodies are designed to move right when we don't move things don't work that well right I always make the um, stupid joke to patients that if you don't move a joint like it's designed to if you don't use it you lose it right your body is a very smart machine when it realizes that hey you haven't moved your hip past 90 degrees because you sit all day I'm going to take away that ability because it's energy sucking for you to squat below 90 degrees because you have not placed that stress so now when you go into your gym and everyone's squatting ass to grass and for some reason you are getting stuck in 90 degrees it's because your body's adapted to that so I always go back to this quote like our bodies are meant for movement the more we move the better we're gonna get at as human beings you know so when Gray was looking at this um, screen idea he wanted to create a standard for movement and he wanted to base it off of like you know you go anywhere in the world and when they screen for hypertension we use a blood pressure cuff right like that's a standard across and when he started this um, process he's trying to figure out like what movements should be part of the screen to standard standardize movement so when you start thinking about as us humans like what do we do from a developmental stage right so if you look through what a child goes through from birth until it's starting to walk there are certain stages right if you start thinking about it you know you start with neck control you start rolling over then you start crawling then you start kneeling squatting standing climbing and then eventually you start running like locomotion right so I love using this picture I have of basically a baby going into uh, a toddler where they develop so if you think about how a baby starts off they're lying on their back and then they go into a prone position where they're on their bellies and if you think of what happens first is that they develop a really really strong um, control of their neck and all those muscles that control neck movement and then they end up learning how to roll over so if you think of what 
applies to rolling, it's a lot of core stability that's required in order for a child to roll over. And then you get into like a quadruped position as a child. And what are we developing there? We're developing a lot of shoulder stability, shoulder strength, hip stability, hip strength. And then we get into crawling. We got that reciprocal opposite arm, opposite leg that is already translating to how we're going to start walking and running. And then we go into a sitting position. Like now we're developing movements that are kind of similar to how we squat, right? And from there, we go into kneeling positions. And then eventually, um, that child is going to learn how to get into a half kneel position, stand up, go into squatting positions. They're going to start standing up straight. They're going to start walking. And now you have a little guy running around, right? So this was kind of the basis, kind of the brainchild of what the functional movement screen became. So I get this question a lot is what can the FMS do? Right, So if you think about what the FMS screen allows you to do, it's designed to capture pain before exercise. Right, So I think this was done so beautifully because so many times when you train somebody, they've had a history of injuries, car accidents, joints that are stiff, joints that are achy and pissed off, and wouldn't it make more sense to know all those things beforehand when designing a program? Right, like say you started exercising and you want to put in shoulder press, for example, because everyone at the gym does the shoulder press. But if you have a joint that's achy, you pressing overhead on a joint that's not functioning the way it should be, it's probably not going to feel good afterwards. And it's probably not going to feel any better a month from now if you were consistently pressing overhead. So this is almost becomes like a risk management tool. So when I get someone in and I ask them, tell me all your injuries that you've had in your life, most of the time people are not gonna tell you anything. They're gonna be like, you know what, no, I'm good. There was one time I rolled my ankle and that's it. But as you start doing this screen, when things don't feel right, don't move right, there's pain captured, they go, oh, well, actually, I did tear my rotator cuff and never rehabbed it. And you're like, okay, here we go. So now you write down on your little sheet for the FMS that I'll talk about soon is, all right, this person has a torn rotator cuff back in 2004, never rehabbed it, and now we're not going to do any pressing overhead. And I'm going to get into that as well. So the other thing, too, that a lot of people make the mistake is that the FMS is not a musculoskeletal evaluation. It's not an orthopedic test. It is a screen for movement. So many coaches that do end up going into the FMS, when they look at certain movements, they overanalyze, overthink, they're like, well, the hips were doing this thing, the toe was going out a little bit, it's definitely this muscle and that muscle not firing at the same sequence and blah, 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 blah. No, it's just a screen for movement. Can the person do it or not with efficiency? So I always tell people, especially coaches that are starting out, you are not a chiro or a physio or any kind of therapist or medical professional out there to decide whether or not a joint is whatever medical term you want to give it because the shoulder mobility test presented this. It is just a screen that will allow you to rate and rank movement patterns. And if there's any kind of dysfunctional pattern, which is, you know, if you know a shoulder that is able to press overhead, you would ideally think that their bicep would be able to be right beside their ear and not like at a 90 degree angle like you're bench pressing while standing. Um, and if there's any asymmetries, because you'll see this in the FMS too, is that say one shoulder has really, really good mobility. And for some reason, the left side, terrible, not even comparable to one side. So now you have all this new information of how this person's um, body is functioning. And then this is the big one. You're not able to diagnose anything from the screen. Just because someone scored super, super low or just failed every single thing, you can say, hey, because you did this, you have X issue with your joint. No, it's can they do the movement or not? 
So what you're able to do with the functional movement screen is identify pain, how the movement looks, if there's any dysfunctional patterns and asymmetries. So with that being said, when you have this information, you can now start create a blueprint for yourself or for um, a client that you want to train. So when you think about it, um, when there's a dysfunctional or asymmetrical pattern um, found in the client, they usually will have a higher risk for injury. So this is where the FMS gets a lot of, let's say, flack or like people arguing that, hey, the FMS can't predict people having injuries. Yes, I get that. And the research is not the greatest on it. But if someone's shoulders, T-spine, hips, and every other joint in their body doesn't move as well as, say, someone that has no issues whatsoever and they go through the FMS like nobody's business, I would probably predict the person with terrible joint mechanics is probably have a higher chance of injuring themselves, especially in a gym setting when they have no idea how to move their body, right? So if you take off um, the whole debate whether or not the FMS can predict injury, the FMS is definitely a good route to go down if you want to have a baseline of how people move and what you should do with them. Right, so when people don't follow, it's kind of like the FMS flow chart of movement and how to improve movement quality. Essentially, what happens is when you go to the gym and you're following a program that you downloaded or bought from a coach that's not specific to you because they've never done an assessment on you, or you found a magazine and you're gonna do a workout called, you know, six weeks to a bigger chest. What you're doing is essentially building strength over dysfunction, and what that means is you're gonna end up injured or having a more achy joint than it should be. And I use this analogy all the time where you're basically throwing grenades and hoping for the best. Most people don't know how to program for themselves or for others. So at least if you are well rehearsed in how the FMS works, you have somewhere where you can start. So if you think about it, if movement any movement is dysfunctional and you're building on top of it, whatever you're building, strength, endurance, hypertrophy, it's going to be flawed and compromised, right? So I use this analogy a lot where, um, you know, you're hitting a square peg in a round hole constantly and eventually something's going to snap, break, chip, whatever. So what I try to convince to new trainers is that you know, we should consider movement deficiencies first before we develop power, strength, or flexibility, or whatever the goal is. If you know someone's shoulder doesn't move the way a shoulder should, wouldn't you want to improve that joint before you start slapping 225 on a barbell? Something's going to give, right? If you are not good at being a human being, when you try to do exercise, you're not going to do too well. Remember, exercise is a human invention because we don't move as much as we did back thousands of years ago, right? Even athletics, like our shoulder joint is not designed to throw a baseball 30,000 plus times a year without any kind of compromise to the joint itself, right? So we need to look at what's deficient in our bodies first and create a base and focus on the fundamentals and not super sexy exercises that we find on Instagram and Facebook, right? If you want to win the game on feeling and moving better and getting strong and getting lean, following the protocol from the functional movement screen is a way to go. So if you translate this to how people wanna lose weight, for example, and you take them through the functional movement screen and they're a disaster, but their whole goal is to lose weight. And you tell them, hey, you can't do X, Y, or Z for exercises right now, but they don't feel like listening to you. They'll get to a certain point where something has to give and your body tells you to F off. And now you have an injury and you have to stop going to the gym. 
And we all know when it comes to successful weight loss, it's the long game. So now when you go back into this whole rehab and movement world, it kind of coincides and almost becomes the partner to successful weight loss and fat loss. Because if the body moves the way it should, you can continue exercising. Like I don't understand why people don't put two and two together. But this is where as us coaches, we need to come together and educate and people should know that your joints need to move well in order to do exercise. So there's a system how the FMS works. So there is a FMS level one certification that teaches you how to use a screen and how to interpret it and kind of starts off of how and what to do afterwards. And then they have the FMS level two, where it goes over corrective strategies, how to improve people's um, mechanics when it comes to movement. And then like I um, uh, mentioned earlier, uh, there's a therapist version called the SFMA. Um, So that essentially is looking at the FMS and breaking it apart even further. So if someone's overhead deep squat was terrible and had pain, now you can go to a therapist that's certified in the SFMA, give them your results, and they already know where to go, and it's going to start breaking down the pattern of what's going on, and they can figure out and diagnose what the issue is, and now relay the information back to the trainer of what you should do and not to do and also give some suggestions on exercise selection. So now you have created this team around the client and now becomes really, really specific to the person, right? So it almost is a disservice to any client out there that we don't do this for them. Like we need to create a baseline on movement to help our clients move and feel better. Bam, all right. So. The screen itself has seven tests, and it's broken up in two parts. So if you look at it, there's primitive uh, primitive movement patterns and higher level movement patterns. And they also break it down into basic stability and mobility movement patterns of something called reciprocal reach pattern and supine alternating leg raising pattern. We'll go into depth in this later, but essentially when you look at... um, how we go back to that example of uh, baby developing, um, there is a reaching pattern that babies will do when they're on their bellies, and that also kind of translates into them rolling and eventually like playing around with their feet and trying to raise their legs, and that's developing core, hip stability, flexibility, everything, you name it. Now from there, it goes into transitional movement patterns that require a higher degree of stability, coronation, movement quality. Um, Those go into things like the trunk stability test, the push-up pattern, and any kind of quadruped uh, rotational stability pattern. I know this is a lot of information, but it all will make sense in the end. Now, We get into higher level movement requirements, things like squatting, lunging, and stepping. But all those things I just mentioned are like the small little foundational things that we need in order to do things like squatting, lunging, and stepping. So if you look at how a baby develops, like is someone proficient in actually lying on their back and doing an exercise? They haven't probably exercised in two decades because they've been sitting at a desk um, working as an accountant or on their computer or whatever. So now they almost lost that ability to do those simple things, but everyone goes past those things that we need as human beings and they go into the higher level movement patterns like squatting, lunging, and stepping. And then you wonder why people's knees buckle in when they squat or when they lunge, their quads are super tight. So all those little things that I've mentioned earlier is what we need as a foundation to move ahead to the things that we all want to do. So the seven patterns in the FMS goes as follows. We have the squat, the hurdle step, inline lunge, shoulder mobility, act to straight leg raise, the trunk stability push-up, and rotary stability. So breaking this down a little bit further, the squat, hurdle step, and inline lunge demonstrate a core stability in three essential foot positions 
as us humans experience on a daily basis. And in the FMS community, we kind of refer to them as the big three, and they require the most um, core stability, coordination, motor control, you name it. Like those are the three that you need to be able to function really um, highly at in order to move without you know pissing off any kind of joints. Now, if you look at the other four, um, they kind of refine informa- information when you place the body um, under any kind of load or movement and they interact upon each other to help identify weak, uh, weak links in movement patterns. So if someone's big three, which is the squat, hurdle, step, and inline lunge, have some weird funky stuff happening, you look at the other four tests to determine what's going on because it kind of paints a bigger picture and goes a little bit more specific. So the cool thing in the FMS is like as you go through the order, things keep popping up. So an example is if someone's right hip is doing some weird thing in the squat, that right hip thing is probably going to show up in the hurdle step, the inline lunge, and then again in the act of straight leg raise, probably in the rotary stability test, and it's just going to keep popping up. So now you see this um, pattern, and now you kind of know where to go. So everything works in harmony in this um, screen, and I think that's where this should be kind of the gold standard. They work upon each other, right? So the other thing um, that the FMS has is a scoring system. So if you look at how the FMS scores, a three is like a perfect, a two is that the person can do it, one is that they could barely do it with a lot of compensations in the movement pattern itself, and um, a zero is if they couldn't do it or if pain was present. So for me, when I first started with the... um, FMS as a coach, I found that I was way too obsessed with the numbers. I was also telling clients that, hey, this was a two, but you want to aim for a three and blah, blah, blah. This is another reason why people will uh, debate the FMS as a scoring system. So when I look at the scoring system nowadays, I don't score. I just write down, can they do it? Yes or no. Right? So it's scored out of 21, and if you had 14 out of 21, you basically pass, you're like good to go, you don't have the risk of injury. Anything below 14, you're basically like a walking, ticking time bomb in the eyes of the FMS. In my opinion, I look at the quality of the movement. So I don't score, I just go, yep, they could do it, or yep, they did an amazing job, or I'll write down notes for each movement pattern. So... I think I'm going to end it there because that was a lot of information and I'm going to do a part two to this where we break down the big three. Breaking down each test. We're starting off with the overhead squat. I think this is so important to check squat mechanics, squat mobility, anything to do with the squat because it's a primitive pattern that we you know, get into as we develop as children. And in our world today, everything we do takes away the ability for us to squat. And then we get into the gym and lo and behold, there's squats in the program and your squat looks like a melted candle. So what does this test actually um, look at? So it challenges the extremity mobility, postural control, core stability, total body mechanics, and neuromuscular control. So when you look at the overhead test, the extremities, meaning your arms and legs, all the mobility of each joint is challenge. Postural control, this is huge. If you think of the overhead squat position, a lot has to happen posturally to stay there. And next is core stability. Can your core fire all the right things to perform the squat. And imagine this, if your body weight squat looks terrible, why do people constantly just go to the gym and do barbell back squats? They have no business being there. And then you wonder why people 
get injured going to the gym. Body mechanics, again, this goes back to, you know, can your body do it? Can your body meet the demand that you're placing it under when you're trying to perform a bodyweight squat? And then it goes down to neuromuscular control. If you've been sitting at a desk for 20 years as an accountant and you haven't went past 90 degrees because that's where you sit all day, when you go to the gym and you challenge range of motion, it's not going to look pretty. So we're going to look at some common um, patterns that people screw up on when they do this test. And the big one is people are limited with their upper body mobility. And usually that's due to glenohumeral and T-spine mobility. So the glenohumeral joint, which is your shoulder joint itself, tends to be a limiting factor along with your T-spine mobility. If your shoulders can't go overhead without any kind of compensation, and usually where the compensation comes to is your elbows or your low back with an overhead position. I see it so many times again, we go back to that accountant that sits at a desk for 20 years and their arms don't go past their keyboard for two decades. And then they go to the gym and there's overhead pressing. They have no business being there. They're literally putting strength over dysfunction and shit is going to fuck up. T-spine mobility. This is huge. Our T-spine is designed to rotate, flex, and extend. Majority of the time, I'd say 95% of our life is in a forward flex position. Now you're telling me that this person, again, we're going back to the account um, example, getting into a extension pattern to be able to do a back squat. And they have no glenohumeral joint range of motion because they sit at a desk all day. So they're cranking their shoulders and contorting their body to get under the barbell and you're telling me that they're not going to feel it in the right places. Like, come on. <laughs> so when I see limitations in the squat, I already attack shoulder mobility and T-spine mobility right off the bat when it comes to training clients, especially general population. Now, the other thing is looking at poor flexion in hips and knees, along with limited dorsiflexion of the ankles. So again, the squat is a complicated movement. It has a lot of moving parts, right? When you think of the squatting pattern, your hips and knees need to have enough flexion in order to perform the movement. If you've been sitting at a desk all day, you're limited to how much flexion and extension you have in your hips if you haven't challenged it. And same thing, when was the last time you moved your ankles and, you know, performed ankle mobility exercises compared to just you walking every day? A lot of people have really, really tight ankles and then the motion, dorsiflexion, is what's required when you lunge, when you squat. And a lot of people are limited in that. And again, it's like, why are people back squatting when you... (laughs) Their shoulders, their T-spine, their hips, their knees and ankles don't move the way a human body should. And then you wonder why the stat of one out of three people have low back pain. Where do you think people are getting mobility from? It's usually their lumbar spine. The lumbar spine is not designed to move in so many different degrees of freedom. It's built to be a stable segment of the body. But we're utilizing our lower back to make up for the mobility that we don't have so when you look at it poor stabilization can be a result in a dysfunctional pattern during the squat so to kind of paint a picture and for those who are seeing the slideshow so again my podcast listeners hit the show notes there's going to be a video recording of this um presentation so the overhead squat positions you have a dowel overhead and you have the individual squat as low as possible and you're looking at whether or not they can do it do they have enough shoulder mobility do they have enough t-spine extension do they have good hip flexion do they have enough knee flexion do they have enough dorsiflexion of their ankles that's what we're looking for when i see a terrible squat the last thing i'm going to do is have someone under the barbell That is the last thing I will get someone to do in their workouts if 
that's one of their goals. If it's not one of their goals, I'm going to really work on that squat pattern with something like a goblet squat, where it forces you to go into a better position. Maybe they're not ready for that, and I'll do an exercise called the face the wall squat, where you're four inches away from the, squ- uh, from the wall. I'm going to have the individual squat as low as possible. When they hit that block, that barrier, I tell them, like, remember that spot. You're going to come back up, deep breath in, exhale on the way down, and just aim for a little inch here and there. And let's work in some mobility exercises and correctives to improve the mechanics of your squat. Man, that was a lot already. This is great. So the next one, the hurdle step. So I have pictures of the hurdle step at the end of all my notes, but um, to put this into, you know, if you had to imagine, um, FMS kit, you basically have a little string that is measured at your tibial tuberosity, and you have the individual with the dowel behind their back, this time in a back squat position, feet together, right leg starts, you go over the hurdle, and you come back without knocking it over, and it should look smooth, easy and no issue but looking back at the hurdle step what it is the hurdle step is a integral part when it comes to locomotion and acceleration so i tell people all the time when people have trouble with the hurdle step and i swear this is one of the hardest um you know screens in the fms is the hurdle step you have to be able to stabilize your entire body on one leg while the other leg moves over the hurdle. So you need a lot of um, mobility and stability and motor control to, in order to do this effectively. And nine out of 10 times, people struggle with this so much. And I tell them all the time that if you are a runner and you have a trouble, uh, trouble doing this movement, that's not a good sign. You know, the hurdle step challenges the body's stride mechanics as well as like i said stability and control on one leg if you can't perform the hurdle step you have no business running long distances and usually runners that come to me for you know movement and rehab their hurdle step is terrible and the reason why they go with the tibial tuberosity is in a perfect run gait cycle your heel should be able to pass that point without any compensation at the hips people just fail at this miserably miserably i can't even talk today um every time and then you wonder why people are like oh yeah after a while when i run my hips hurt my knees hurt i get shin splints my ankles hurt sometimes and my neck kind of hurt sometimes so this is where you know, things start popping up like, holy crap, this person needs a lot of single leg work, a lot of single st- uh, leg stability, some hip stabilization, like it starts really painting a clear picture of what the person needs. So common ways that people screw up the hurdle step, the big one is the upper body will start compensating for the stepping pattern. I see it a lot of time, people will hunch forward to grab more mobility through their hips. Like, that, no, that should not happen. You know, um, people with poor mobility and stability are not going to do well on this test. And a lot of times what happens is people have tight hips. So they get to a certain point where trying to, they're lifting their leg over the hurdle. They run out of hip flexion. So what happens? Their lumbar spine tucks under to fake. You know, they do a little butt wink movement to... Um, cheat the movement to get over the hurdle now that tells me that every time when they go into hip flexion their lumbar spine likes to move for them and that's a huge terrible pattern for someone to have when it comes to exercising the big thing with this hurdle step is that a lot of times people will look at it from an eye of a medical professional you know the big thing with the fms i tell every new trainer or any um person interested in assessments is that you are not a physio or chiro to determine what's going on you know you're not breaking down the pattern that's what i always say like an example is this like well this person internally rotates their hip to get over the thing and it must be an external hip rotators causing a faulty pattern blah 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 blah. like 
you're overthinking it. It's can the person do the pattern, yes or no. Don't go any deeper or further than that. You don't have to overcomplicate things. So if you are watching my screen that I'm recording, that is the hurdle step. All right, we're gonna get into the inline lunge. As you can see, a lot of this is to do with the hips, but the hips are directly related to the shoulder girdle. And those two things are key players when it comes to exercise. If your sh shoulder girdle, meaning your T-spine and your glenohumeral joints, if they do not move they, the way they should and your hips don't move the way, the way they should, usually people have low back pain, knee pain, ankle pain, neck pain, right? Do you see the common theme here? You make your hips and shoulder girdle work really well, pain goes away. All right. So the inline lunge is focused on a deceleration of movement and directional changes produced in exercise and in sport. This is huge, huge. If you want to do anything athletic, the inline lunge tests that. So it also challenges spine stabilization along with hip, knee, ankle, and foot mobility and stability. Like literally almost everything everything is challenged here in a split stance. So the inline lunge is literally a lunge just in line. Like if you had to like paint a line on the ground, place both feet in a split squat position, and then you're gonna lunge straight down and back up. But the kicker is that you have the dowel behind you touching your tailbone, um, T-spine and your head, and then your hands in a um, top and bottom hand position to also chest, chest, check um, if you can stabilize your spine in a neutral position because the moment the dowel comes off, say your tailbone or your head, like you can't keep a neutral spine. So now imagine when people are doing lunges and you're telling them to hold on to weights and they can't even hold their spine up straight in a body weight position. Ah, oh, man. Sometimes when I see other trainers, it just really pisses me off that they're literally making their clients worse. All right. Here is where people screw up. If they have hip, knee, and ankle mobility issues, it's going to show up here really, really quickly. It also challenges their dynamic stability. And when they can't stabilize in a dynamic movement, usually what happens is they can't complete it. And if you think about how our bodies are designed, we're supposed to move in a dynamic way. Like think about when we walk, it's opposite hand and opposite leg. It's a contralateral load across our joints. And then when you get someone to do something like step ups, they don't even understand or phantom the idea of, I gotta lift my right hand when I have my left leg up. And they have to think about it. I'm like, this should be natural. Like, we're not good at human anymore. And we need to change that. Um, and then again, it goes back to T-spine mobility. And that can really change how um, the mechanics of a lunge can happen. If you think about it, if you can't keep neutral spine like I was talking before. And I'm just going to put up the picture here. How are you supposed to hold dumbbells by your side or a kettlebell, sandbag or whatever without your entire torso collapsing? So this is where, you know, progressions and regressions are so critical and important and vital to the success of your clients and to you. Like, how do you know that you picking the certain exercise you saw on Instagram is the one for you? How do you know that's actually going to improve your body's function? So I'm going to end it there and I want everyone to really, really think about, you know, am I doing exercises in my workout routine right now that are actually complementing what I'm trying to achieve? Yes, fitness and weight loss and blah, blah, blah is important. But if you're doing exercises that are slowly tearing you down, you're going to end up taking time off of the gym to recover from your injury. I see it all the time in the clinic where... People come in, they're like, oh, my knee's bugging me. And then we assess their hip. They have no hip. Like you test internal rotation and it's like, Meh, it doesn't go anywhere. And then your other hip has 
a lot of internal rotation, but terrible external rotation. And then I put them through the FMS, and their lunge and squat look terrible. And then I ask them, what are you doing in the classes? Oh, plyometric split squat jumps. I'm like, what the fuck? How? And you're literally jamming a square peg in a round hole over and over and over again. And your body goes, fuck this. This is over. So, I want you guys to really evaluate what you're putting into your program and the programs of your clients. Do they actually give the benefit to them to move and feel better? Let's rock and roll. All right, before we get started. This table is so far away. Um, let's go with like three things you've learned last time. No. Yeah, you're testing us? Yeah. What, 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 what did we learn? Oh my god. What did we learn? What are babies? Babies. <laughs> babies. Uh, well. Because we covered what the FMS is. Let me take my notes. Yeah, well, my notes. <laughs> yeah. We covered what the FMS is, what it does, how it was created. Um, we went over the, overhead squat, yeah. middle step, inline lunge, and shoulder mobility. But that's how we learn. Oh, you mean like, like? Did we get through the entire shoulder mobility? No. 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 We just touched on like what you kind of test for. Okay. Um, okay. So with the ones that we covered, overhead squat, hurdle step, inline lunge, what were some key things that you took away from those things? Mm. Key things. Or just give me like a review of what it is, what it tests for, where do people screw up? So, um, the, so squatting, obviously, like not being able to come all like having a deep squat, like not being able to come all the way down with a straight spine. Um, hurdle, not being able to actually lift your leg like, over properly yeah. without having a straight leg. Same legs, but, yeah. Um, I think I what I love about the deep squat, just kind of go back, is like with the dowel, is if people um, on their squat tend to lean forward, it shows like lack of T spine mobility, mm-hmm. and I think that's really cool because a lot of people squat and you don't know necessarily if they're limited T spine without kind of forcing that position, mm-hmm. and then and then taking the dowel away and seeing if if you take the dowel away, if then the squat looks better. Yeah. I think that's a really cool thing to do to test to see what's actually happening in that position. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, like the deep squat will show you a lot, and yeah. especially when we actually get into how to test the deep squat and break them down. So, like, you already know for Camila, um, say you do the overhead squat and it looks mm-hmm. terrible, the first thing you do is you elevate her heels yeah. on the board, yeah. and usually that changes quite a bit of stuff. And then you can take away the dowel and cross the arms. And if it looks even better, you're like, okay, now we're kind of unraveling what's, what's going on with the person. And like, actually the guy who sent me, Russ, he was very impressed with the FMS. He was like super excited to know like what's going on with the body. Yeah, and yeah. So like the moment I elevated his heels, he was like, oh my God, my squat feels so much better. I'm like, yeah, you can do that in the class. He's like, oh my God. <laughs> Yeah, seriously, sometimes it's just like small things like that. Yeah. Because a lot of people know that their body doesn't move the way like the person in the class moves, and they're like, oh, what the hell it gives? Then you put them through the FMS, and they're like, oh my god, finally. Yeah. Right? So it's, one, yeah. makes you look like a god. Yeah. And Ooh. two, like. I know, because he's telling me, I'm like, why is she? I'm like, well, I'm taking the FMS. And he's like, no, go do it. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Did you know that you like really hurt himself really badly? Before coming here? Yeah. Like, yeah. He's been dealing with it for like a while, I think. Yeah, you went to uh, formerly known as Bootcamp Effect, Be yeah. Fit, yeah. and like deadlifted and passed out. From passed out? You, yeah, so it's like, he told me like basically at one point, he's like, now I'm on the floor. Wow. Right? And like when I checked, like we'll go over today after straight leg raise, he has no business deadlifting off the floor. I'm like, no wonder. Like, he probably has some sort of disc issue that hit his nerve, and that's usually when people, like, collapse to the ground. And he said, like, the owner of the gym had to, like, drag him to the car to get him home. I'm like, why did you call him? 
Yeah. That's not even that is so funny. Yeah. Wow. And like um like shoulder mobility, he's like Oh yeah. No way. Right? Like, right. And with an arch too. So it's like I'm like are you pressing overhead in class? And he's like, yeah, I'm like Yeah, it's a good thing we're gonna have shoulder mobility. He's gonna that's gonna change his workouts. Big time. Like I told him like dude, like better. we're gonna because I he's gonna go see Sarah. And I'm like, you're gonna like be blown away how much you're better you're gonna feel after yeah. you're out seeing her, yeah. what we're gonna do in the gym and how we're gonna change your workout. Yeah. It's just so exciting. Oh, just yeah. because of like fifteen minutes yeah. of just seeing how he moves. Like, yeah. Well, it's huge. Uh, so that's one thing that I wanna really um like go over in detail is is what they need to avoid yep. if they cannot succeed in my course movements. Yeah. So like um, that gets into like the level two of the FMS of like corrective strategies, but we'll get into that as well. Okay. Um, how far did I get into shoulder mobility? Did I just like skim the surface? You did not go into it. You skip. You went. You grazed over it. All right. So um, really it. One of my favorite ways to describe the shoulder mobility test is literally that first sentence where the shoulder mobility test demonstrates a natural harmonized rhythm of the scapular thoracic region. So what that means is in order for someone to use their shoulder, their scapula has to have a really good relationship with their thoracic spine. A lot of times those, those two things don't move really well with general population because they're in this posture all freaking day and that scapula kind of gets stuck onto the thoracic spine. So they're gonna find mobility elsewhere to be able to do this, and it's usually every single rep to get there, right? So anytime there's an injury, how I explain to patients, it's like one joint's not moving properly, so the joint below or above is gonna take up the grunt of the work, and it's usually not designed to do that. So if you look at like anatomy, your scapula kind of floats on top of thoracic spine. And in here, we have like 17 intrinsic muscles that have to work all together at the same time for you to do this stuff, this stuff, this stuff. And when those things don't work, things like, when I give like shoulder cars to a patient and they come up, they're all good, and then they start rotating and then this happens. <laughs> or this happens, right? So like now they've taught their trap to be hyperactive, to only move the scapula when really it should not be moving at certain points of this, um, scapular rhythm. And if you were like, oh yeah, my traps are always tight, I always go for massage and nothing's working. It's like, well fuck, you make your shoulders move better. Right, that's like literally what the issue is. Um, so when you do the mobility test, there is a, anyway, um, this mobility test for the shoulder, mm -hmm. we're checking like active range of motion of external and internal rotation of both the shoulders at the same time. And you'll always kind of like when we go into it, when I show people, I tell them to always kind of make a mental mark of where the top hand ends up and where the bottom hand ends up in this position. And then when you switch to the other side, see where it kind of falls mm -hmm. into an asymmetrical pattern. Um, So this is a good one, the poor round shoulder syndrome, leaving the glenohumeral humeral joint and scapula restricted and not able to perform as intended. So a lot of people that we see are kind of like this. So now that shoulder joint, glenohumeral humeral joint, should not be there. So this is where um, this concept of joint centration, in order to use your shoulder properly from this position, you need to suck in hat. You can come through. Okay, sorry, I'm going to take a little You're on camera oh. too. Say oh, perfect. <laughs> So if I told someone to deadlift like this with their shoulders, probably not going to feel good on the rest of their body. But if you told them to centrate their shoulder joint and pack it in, it's probably going to work a little bit better. Um, so the so wait, what did you do there? Because you were you kind of pulled it back, but then your shoulder blade like stuck out. Yeah, so like that was like an exaggeration. So like oh. that would be like scapular winging, but essentially the shoulder for it to work properly for any kind of movement, mm -hmm. you want it to be centrated yeah, okay. in the center, right? Yeah. Just like if 
A lot of people don't understand how to do that. Like I say, like pull the shoulders back and like they don't. Again, there's also like just the teaching of proper movement. Um, that's where I use the Turkish get up a lot, and usually the first thing I teach them is like when you're laying down on the Turkish get up, yeah. you need to have that. Yeah. So what I do, and we can do it later when we get into like uh, how to do the FMS. Yeah. Yeah. I'm good. I'm good. Um, when a person's laying down in that initial position, I get them to hold my hand. And I tell them, okay, be super loose so I can move their shoulder, like, no problem. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, now don't let me move you. And squeeze my hand as hard as possible. And when I lift them, they come off the ground as one unit. Mm -hmm. Right? So if you think of the okay. barbell deadlift, squeeze the crap out of the bar. Yeah. Now the shoulder's going to go in the right position. That's why I use so many carries with people. Because if you took two heavy dumbbells or kettlebells, mm -hmm. this is not going to feel good. So for, for uh, Happy, because she has... That issue you with your shoulder. Um, it, you, you told her to rotate her. A little bit, yeah. Oh, just a little bit. Because okay. if because her mm -hmm. issue is rotator cuff. Mm -hmm. If you're holding a kettlebell dumbbell and you go up into 20 degrees of abduction and external rotation, you're getting all of your rotators fired, mm -hmm. right? For the general population that don't have a rotator cuff issue. Like you won't be able to go that heavy because if the rotator cuff is four muscles that are pretty small. Yeah. But if you're down here with heavy weight, going into bad postures. What's like, what's the difference though between like you know how you told me to like ex like pull out like that versus this? Is because like if you look at how the rotator cuff muscles work, like if you externally rotate, um, I can't remember this correctly. Uh, you'll have infraspinatus and supraspinatus turn on. When you go here, they don't turn on. Mm -hmm. So because her whole issue is her rotator cuff, I want all of them to be turned Stop. on at the same time. Yeah. Right? Um, so yeah, going back to like joint centration, one way that I teach them is the triggers get up, but also pharma care. So if I have heavy enough weight, falling into that pot, that posture is not going to feel good. So automatically the person goes here. And now I'm teaching them that this is a better position and then because we're holding something tight anytime you grip something tight it sends a signal up to the shoulder that hey we have something heavy let's get into a better position it's just like if i told someone to go pick up a hundred pound dumbbell off our rack they're not gonna go like this and they're, they're, they're gonna brace everything and get super tight and then drive up a lot of like training to make things feel and look better is like create more tension in your body mm -hmm. and things move in the way it should right mm -hmm. Uh, questions, thoughts, no? Okay. Um, so with the shoulder mobility test, um, so that's how it looks, and that's the clearance exam. So when I start the FMS, I ask people, give me every single injury you've had since the age of three. Like from rolled ankles to like car accidents, everything. Like I try to figure out everything they have and they're like, yeah, you know, I tore my rotator cuff in 2006, I did this, blah, 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 blah. The clear in test here that this guy, Tony Jeff McClure, is doing, clears them for impingement. So essentially, if you put your um, palm on your shoulder without lifting it up, if you just drive the elbow up, and if you had like a torn rotator cuff or something going on with that shoulder, this would start pinching with pain. So if they get this as an automatic zero, you don't even bother trying no, this because it's probably going to hurt them. Mm -hmm. Right, so that's like again, like if you find pain, that's when you like make a little note and like go see Sarah or Darren because they can figure out how to fix that. Um, yeah, so there's some clearance tests throughout the FMS. This is one of the three, right? So you always start with this guy because like if someone has shoulder pain, I tell him to do this. It's probably gonna really piss off whatever injury they might have. But um, what would you call it? This? Pinterest test. Oh. Yeah. Um, so essentially, how we do the mobility one uh, for the shoulders if they clear it, um, you get a measurement out of their hand. And uh, from the crease, like if you look at your wrist, everyone has that first crease. And that's where you put the dowel. And then the second piece of the dowel will go to the middle finger or whatever finger is longer. Right? Because everyone has a anatomy, a difference in anatomy, 
So like sometimes you'll find people that like their middle finger is actually not their longest. Yeah. So that's always the longest finger. <laughs> <You're doing> that. <laughs> it's like, oh my god, I'm a freak. <laughs> um, so yeah, essentially that would be the measurement. Okay. Right? Um, so. Of the space that you are allowed to have. Or that. So that would be the measurement you would take, and then whatever number that is, say it's 20. Yeah. When they go into the shoulder mobility, you're looking for at least 20. Okay. If there's yeah. anything beyond that, then you got some mobility, stability issues that you would have to address. All right. Um, so the active straight leg raise goes back to Russ that came in. Um, so a lot of people look at it as a flexibility test, but it's actually not. So if you look at um, the book movement that I mentioned, they go really, really in depth of what this test is. But essentially what we're looking for, yeah, um, is to identify the active mobility of the flex hip, but also includes the continuous core stability within the pattern of hip extension. So a good indicator you'll see a lot of times when people cheat in this is what the opposite leg is doing. So when the active straight leg raise happens, you just ask the person to lift their leg up as high as possible until you tell them to stop. But when people want to cheat this because they're trying to impress you, the opposite leg is what I'm looking at. So if there's some sort of like um, restriction in the hip or in some sort of stability of the hip and core, they'll open up the leg off to the side and now the hips are a little bit more open to get a little bit further. So you're constantly looking at what the opposite hip is doing. And again, yeah, it is going to test some sort of flexibility, but not so much the hamstring, but more like gastroc and soleus, if they can't f get through there. So like for Russ, like um, if I had to score him, he would be at one on each side. So he has, again, no business deadlifting off the floor. That's probably why he had some sort of disc, disc issue when he was training at boot camp effect. Mm -hmm. Right? So if like you already knew that, like, then you that, that would have never happened. And I just told him, like, just elevate your deadlift and you'll be fine. And he's like, oh, okay, cool. Like, it's that easy. It's like small so little changes. So it's okay for when you're testing that straight leg, um, it, for it to be bent for some people? Can it extend through the Well, like, again, like, I want them to be straight. As but as if their natural thing is to, like, come up and that's going to be a compensation pattern, yeah. like, you already know that there's something, something. going on. Mm -hmm. But I'll, again, this kind of goes back to the whole idea of like in the hurdle step when people kind of like over examine what's going on. It's like, can they do it or not? Yeah, but they don't have to go that high. Like what if they can only go this high? So again, it goes back to the measurement. So we'll go through when we start um, attacking each other, but yeah. essentially this goes back to the individual. So you grab the FMS stick, mm -hmm. find the big bony part of your hip, from there to the middle part of your patella, Whatever the number is, say it's 40, you mark down on their thigh where the 20 mark is, and then their ankle bone has to pass that number in order to get a perfect score without any kind of compensation. It's 90 degrees. A little bit below, like they usually say like another, actually I don't even know that from that stick if it's inches, centimeters, whatever, whatever their numerical what system is. What do you mean is. Go past that number? How, like, past All right, let's get you on the floor. <laughs> I gotta go turn the mic, so. Oh, Alright, so go two feet together. So imagine if I have the FMS dowel, yeah. find this guy, this guy, yeah. and measure the distance, say it's 40, and the 20 mark is here. Yeah. Usually, because you'll have a pen doing the um, marking, I'll put the pen down right here, mm -hmm. and then when I ask you to lift this leg without any conversation, this bone would have to oh, get to that okay. part. Okay. Right, so again, it goes back to the individual. So it doesn't matter if someone's six foot five or okay, four foot five. Yeah. Right. Um, so the couple of things that I always see when people screw that up. So say if I was lying down, kind of going back to what happens with the foot. So say I'm testing this leg and I'm coming up, and then this starts happening. So I'm rolling my pelvis over to get more range. Mm -hmm. Or, because you'll also have the board underneath you, mm -hmm. they can also pop this knee up to also get a little bit more range. But they're not supposed to? It should be straight. Yeah. Okay. Right? The big thing that I see with the active straight leg raise is like, say um, one side is a lot better than the other, then it's a bigger issue. Mm -hmm. So anytime there's an asymmetry, 
that's like a kind of like a big red flag for me because like saying now when they're deadlifting, if you know one leg has better active range of motion than the other, they might have, like again this would be an exaggeration, but like say as they're coming up, they're going to shift over to the hip that's a little bit better to come back up, and they have this weird kind of thing. So actually, with like Russ when he squats, like he he has one worse hip than the other. So when he was going into a squat, he would lean this way and then come back in and then back up. So now when you're thinking in the classes, if he's doing barbell back squats, that's the position he's always going in. Again, I told him, like, not right there, and then that's where you're going to get injured, but like three months down the road, you're like, oh, why is this kind of like achy? Mm -hmm. And you have no idea why, right? And like he, um, so in the squat on the FMS, they want you to have your toes straight on purpose to really challenge hip mobility. So for him, the moment he started, like, by his second rep, his feet were, like, already this way. Because he's trying to really cheat for it. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, small things like that will pop up where you That's are. cheating? Oh, well, I guess for the FMS. For the FMS. But, okay. but when it comes to, like, actual squatting mechanics, you just find what works best for the person. Mm -hmm. Like, I would never get anyone squatting like that. It's just for the FMS. Okay. So, again, yeah, that's how it looks when they when we will eventually do the active straight leg raise. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Any questions on that, though? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so the trunk stability push-up. So it tests a lot of things. So it wants to see how your body like stabilizes when it comes to the core and the pelvis. And it also tests your extension and rotation. And those are usually the compensation patterns you'll see in the T, I call that T push-up for short. Um, so for the trunk stability push-up, essentially how you test uh, how the core uh, works for the individual when it comes to stabilizing the spine in the sagittal plane is you'll actually set them up. So for men, it's a little bit higher than women. So you would get them with their thumbs like this and you would line it up at the top of their hairline. Mm -hmm. So the push-up would actually look a lot higher. Okay. And when I would ask the person to come up into a push-up, they end up looking like this. So a lot has to happen in order to lift. And a lot of times people will like do things where still kind of do one of those to come up, right? And a lot of times when I'm looking at if one hip doesn't come up with the other. What if you can't push up? So, say I got a guy and you couldn't do that, I would go down to the cheekbones, you couldn't do that, I would go down to the chin from there and then like a regular push up position. Okay. But it's like when it comes to the scoring, this would be a three if they can do it. If you have to go down, you take it down by one um, score. Does that help you to push up like that with your head so forward? Depends. <laughs> Right, like it, it can be definitely an exercise, but it's a very advanced exercise. Yeah. And usually, when I get people to do this, it's like literally just one rep. Okay. And a lot of people, when I get them set up, they're like, they start laughing because they're like, "Fuck, I don't even know how I'm going to do this." But I'm like, I just want to see what your body does. So can they do knees down? I'm um, like, I just tell them like, I just want you to come up as as oh. one. Okay. So like for women, usually what I see because like for them, you start them at the cheekbones, mm -hmm. and a lot of times it's like that mm -hmm. right so they don't know how to engage and stabilize their spine with their pelvis in order for it to come back up mm -hmm. so when i see that it's like one they shouldn't be doing push-ups off the ground because it's like you're not doing them any favors you're not actually getting them stronger mm -hmm. i would elevate the crap out of their push-ups but now that i see that their hip is kind of like sagging with the rest of their body like it's kind of a stretch, but most likely they don't have good pelvic core control at all. And you see that a lot with women. Yeah. So it's like teaching them like basic breathing patterns and pelvic floor control in order for that to like come up as one. Um, and then again, when you see like the hip sag on one side, I start thinking about what other things we saw in the FMS that deal with the hip. So maybe that say left hip that sagged to kind of get back up from the push up was also the same side when they did the hurdle step where they were kind of like, oh my God. And now you start seeing a pattern, right? And like I've even seen in screens where like even when I did the inline lunge, like one side the person was completely fine, the other side they go, they get down and they're like, 
they can't get back up. So it's like huge asymmetry. And you'll start seeing like a lot of the stuff in the FMS kind of play on top of each other. And they just give you more information on that. Mm -hmm. Questions? Yeah. Okay. But you said start at the forehead, but for women at the cheeks? At cheeks, yeah. And then if they can't do it from there, you just go down by one, right? Um, so there's also a clearing exam, but you can do it after, right? So, so one question. Yeah. Like, if, if, because I see a lot of women like peel themselves off the ground when it comes to a push up. So that just means poor stability and, and not being able to connect. It's not, yeah. It doesn't mean that they don't have the strength. Yes and no. So I look at it as like any movement. So this goes back to my talk about Boyle's core thing. So in order to have really good core stability, it all starts here. Mm. Your arms are just an extension of that and your legs are an extension of that. So yes, a push-up does require strength, but it starts from here. If this doesn't work, then there's going to be some weird kind of movement pattern, mm. but it all starts with learning how to utilize this properly. And like anytime you see someone that, from Aura that goes into the clinic and like them trying to breathe properly, they can't breathe. So it's like now you know their diaphragm doesn't work. Most likely their pelvic floor hasn't How been. How do you know they can't breathe? Simple like like what I do with someone in an assessment, like when I do a full assessment, I go one hand on your belly, one hand on your chest, breathe for me three times, and they're like this. I'm like, the fuck was that? <laughs> right? Where it should be. Right? Like if they breathe into their chest. So like a good breath through the diaphragm starts here and ends here, but most people do it in the reverse, right? What if you have reverse breathing? Then they're fucked. <laughs> no, <but> like, <laughs> have you ever encountered comes... that? Someone with reverse breathing? Yeah, like most of, most most people have a breathing disorder, right? So as I teach them how to breathe through their diaphragm properly. Then I go, can you breathe into my hands here? Because your diaphragm should be able to expand all the way around you, right? So a proper breath is like, I get people thinking if you're gonna have the, this little crest of your hand mm -hmm. underneath your rib cage, mm -hmm. the fingers in the front, and then your thumb in the back, yeah. and you should be able to breathe in all of those directions yeah. to stabilize, right? So all the time with the low back people that have pain, it's because they don't know how to use this to protect mm -hmm. their spine. Mm -hmm. So I tell them, like, if you think of a Coke can that's unopened, you can put it on the floor, step on it with your whole body weight, it's not going to go anywhere because of the compressed air that circulates the entire can. The moment you open it, pour it out, you step on it, yeah. so that's the analogy I give people when that's they try cool. to do something heavy, yeah. how do you get your like stabilization? If you look at power lifters, they have huge ass bellies, yeah. but they're super lean. It's just because their sport requires so much spinal stability, which comes from their diaphragm. So now their diaphragm grew to a point where it can extend that far. So then what was, what's the point of belt with these? It's a training tool in a sense of like, it doesn't create stability, but it helps with stability with the diaphragm. So if I went to go push you over, your natural like reaction is to resist against me. If I put a belt pulling against my diaphragm, the only way for me to breathe is against it, yeah. right? It's just like a feedback tool, mm -hmm. right? So going back to that idea, like if you look at kids, their shirts off running around, they have like pop bellies because they know how to use their diaphragm. But like, as we age, we just learn how to breathe through here. And then people get tight necks all through here because they're constantly doing this. And when you train people, they're always kind of like, they start rowing and they naturally do this as they're breathing. You're like, relax, they're like, oh wow. <laughs> and then go back to it because that's a habit, right? So it's a motor pattern that you have to like reteach. And a lot of times when I start teaching people how to breathe, they're like, like they don't even know how to like get that mind connection with their breath, right? So there's different positions that help, mm -hmm. um, like crocodile breathing, where you have um, your belly on the floor hands like this, forehead on, and I would just tell people like breathe into the ground like you're trying to push yourself off, mm -hmm. right? And then when you started thinking of breathing with general, uh, general population, a lot of them are super stressed, high anxiety, can't sleep, 
and I tell every single patient, I'm like, if you can't fall asleep, just 30 of these. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is like the vagus nerve, like one of the biggest nerves in your body when it comes to your nervous system, is directly inserted from top down into your diaphragm. So every diaphragmic breath is stimulating that nerve that is responsible for calming you down. Mm -hmm. So no wonder people fall asleep mm -hmm. or feel super relaxed in yoga when yes. you're focusing on your breath. Yeah. Right, so it's all intertwined, all starting from diaphragm, mm -hmm. right? So it's like, when you start explaining things like that to like clients, they're like, holy shit, yeah. like, they, they get, you get a little bit more buy-in. Like I look at the FMS as more buy-in of what you do and you actually like kind of separate yourself from other people. Mm -hmm. um, clearance exam. So this one's done afterwards. Um, so with low back people, when they finish the thing, you just tell them to bring your hands down and you ask them to extend to here and you ask them, is there any pain in your low back? If they say no, then you're good. So people can get low back pain either based on flexion or extension. A lot of times people have pain in flexion stuff. So extension is what they kind of want. Like most times people will say like, oh, it's just tight. That's fine, but if there's like sharp pain, then that's where you want to they can't even get to that point. They're what, whatever, they, what, how far it doesn't oh, matter. Okay. It's just, you want to see how their spine reacts into extension. Okay. Um, questions? Thoughts? No, I'm really liking the, that diaphragm point. <laughs> yeah, like it's key for everything, right? Yeah. Like, if you, another analogy I give to people of how strong a diaphragm is, is if you look at like gymnasts that do an iron cross, watch their diaphragm go. It goes like crazy. Mm -hmm. If you go to Cirque du Soleil and the guys that are shirtless that do like yeah. human flags, again, diaphragm going like crazy, mm -hmm. right? Like breath is everything, mm -hmm. right? Um, so rotor stability, focus on the multiplane pelvis core, shirtle up, shoulder, shoulder girdle stability while combined with upper and lower extremity movement. So this tests neuromuscular coordination, reflex stabilization in the transverse plane, as well as coordinated efforts of both mobility and stability in a climbing slash crawling pattern. So this shows so much in the movement, and this is where a lot of people suck at. So essentially, um, this is the test, so essentially the bird dog. Mm -hmm. So you're testing a lot of things. So when I look at the bird dog, it's one, seeing if they can uh, stabilize their core with a dynamic movement. And when you think of going like opposite arm, opposite leg, it should be very, very easy for the individual because we walk opposite arm, opposite leg every day. Mm -hmm. But when you test to stabilize that, people for some reason just have terrible control. So one, we're seeing if the core can stabilize the spine, staying neutral, but also the opposite hip, if I'm reaching this way, if this hip can stabilize. Mm -hmm. a lot of times when I see when people try to do this movement, if they have uh, a poor hip stabilizer, they lean over to it to compensate, mm -hmm. right? So say we had that individual that was doing the hurdle step, the left hip was kind of unstable, and then we did the T push up, and again, that hip is kind of sagging. And then we go into this one and I'm doing this side and I'm leaning over. Mm -hmm. Then it's like always going back to that left hip that needs more stability. And usually sometimes on the other side, it's like maybe a mobility issue or it's completely fine. Mm -hmm. Then the other thing I look at um, the rotary stability test is you can also see if there's a mobility issue. So an example, like with Russ, he had terrible shoulders. So when he comes to here, and it comes in because he has terrible shoulder mobility. Mm. He stops here and he's trying to get his hip mm. to alternate, right? So a lot of times you can also see what their compensation pattern is. And sometimes you'll get people who have really tight hips and really tough shoulders where they can't even like get to the middle. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, seeing if people can actually extend their hip without doing this constantly. So you'll see a lot of people do this mm -hmm. yeah. and then back in. So that's telling me that every time they try to extend their hip, it actually goes low back hamstring glute. And if someone really wanted to develop their glutes, they would learn how to extend their hip, ass, hamstring, then low back. Mm -hmm. So like, I can't remember what day it is. 
in our classes when we have like the band and they're just yeah. doing this, but everyone's like, I know, I know, that's awful. Right? So like, <laughs> essentially, like that's just an advanced exercise for them. Mm -hmm. So when I teach the bird dog to like war members that you know have done the bird dog in classes, they're like, why is this so hard? Mm -hmm. and I'm like, because you're actually doing it right. So how I coach like the bird dog is mm, you've, we've done the bird dog right. Mm -hmm. Right, so like literally kicking that heel, not past their bum, because again, like a good hip has 20 degrees of extension. Beyond that, it's just all a little back, right? Um, so yeah, you get the person extending just to in line with their bum, opposite hand goes, and then you're also with the other hand engaging your lat, and that becomes like an actual really good spinal stability exercise. Um, so like with Dr. Stuart McGill, um, the bird dog is like his go-to with anyone that's low back pain. And anytime you see someone with low back pain, you give them the bird dog, they do terribly because they don't know how to use this. Mm -hmm. So it's like, now as a coach, you're thinking that I'm gonna go over breathing with them. I have to teach them how to do the bird dog properly. And then if they start mastering those two, things start feeling a lot better and then they translate to harder things like deadlifting and crap like that. Mm -hmm. But then it goes like back to like, if the person can't breathe properly, and you know, Sally Sue, mom of three, goes to pick up her kid that's like 30 pounds and she has no core activation whatsoever. It's gonna constantly go here, here, wherever else. But yeah, it's a full circle of just crap. <laughs> uh, but this tells me a lot. Um, so now there's another clearing test for that. So say they finish the bird dog after you just get them into like a child's pose and you ask if there's a little back pain in that. So this is to test if there's any kind of flexion-based pain. I've never been exposed to someone who's had low back pain in the child's pose. Mm -hmm. Actually, maybe it's been only once. And that kind of speaks volume, like if they ever get pain in the child's pose, then it's like they definitely need to go see somebody. Yeah. Um, even extension, like definitely need to go see somebody, but um, any questions on that one? Yeah. All right, pain. So pain is associated with behaviors that reduce systematic gathering of objective information. It produces apprehension, inconsistency, and magnification, uh, magnification of fear and denial. So if you think of that definition, if someone had pain in their knee, their body's gonna figure out a way to go around it constantly. So a lot of times when we train people, and I've seen it over the years of my career, people will never go get their knee checked out. They're gonna just work around it. And a lot of times they'll create more problems than solutions. Sometimes there's ways to go around it where someone's like, they've had their knee done three times for their ACL and it's like, hey, that's the best it's gonna get. But if it's like a brand new thing and you're like, go see somebody, go see somebody, and they don't do anything, it's somewhere down the chain is gonna take the grunt of the work, mm -hmm. and it's gonna cause a lot of issues. So like, say again, you're squatting, and that knee is the culprit, some weird thing's gonna happen to avoid it, right, constantly. That's why like when you roll your ankle and you're trying to walk, your body compensates the movement for you to keep going. Mm -hmm. And that's why like a lot of people, like I look at me, like, People rolling their ankles this is actually a pretty serious injury because what happens if you don't deal with that scar tissue properly scar tissue is like dumb tissue mm -hmm. it's going to change your gait and now what else is going to be affected down the road right like literally our bodies are so connected when it comes to movement it's ridiculous um so yeah shitty movement uh patterns develop oh, what did I do? Uh, <coughs> so a good example of pain is like, say the person yeah, hurt their ankle or knee, never dealt with it, body adapts to it. Um, that's where you'll see weird movement patterns in the gym. So like stuff that you can't explain, like say someone's constantly back squatting like this, and you're like, what the fuck is going on with this person? Like their brain reprogrammed itself that because of that knee injury, this is the least amount of pain that's going to go into a squatting pattern without too much knee flexion, and that becomes your new normal. Now when you start training them and picking exercises, you have to reprogram years 
of shitty movement patterns to get there. And I've seen like pretty good um, results when it comes um, to that. Like a good example is I had one kid that I started training at 16 and he was a rugby player who was constantly injured. And like his toe touch, for example, was like literally this. But I started training him three days a week for like four years and he was able to get down here. Like again, we didn't do any stretching, we didn't like, it was just good training, corrective exercises and things like that. And then he started getting less injured, less pains and aches. Mm -hmm. So really like exercise could be like any modality of health, right? Rather than like constantly going to massage or like constantly stretching your hamstrings like yeah. this and it's like nothing's happening. Like exercise has a huge influence on our body and if it doesn't help, that's where I tell people to uh, uh, refer out. But we can kind of go into screening if you want. Sure. Yeah. Questions before we go to the gym? Yeah. 